suffering at the hands of Rome, cause they believed in Christ alone. They died through Europe, especially Spain, for they saw all but Christ is vain. He suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin. Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand. The Roman popes rule the land. Those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy. We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie, with 50 million reasons why. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening. Welcome to Walt Stickle's Mystery Babylon News Radio. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be guest hosting for the next hour. And we are reading and discussing the book uh, Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness. And last time we concluded on page 320 of the book. I'll repeat, I'll, uh, repeat a few paragraphs for continuity purposes in the recording. And uh, we'll conclude with uh, a request for uh, discussion amongst the listeners, and then we'll close. Uh, remember last time we were talking about Old Testament analogies that we can read for ourselves that foreshadow the Protestant Reformation. Yes, the Protestant Reformation had its equivalent in the Old Testament. And for us to understand what the Protestant Reformation was, we need to understand its, its foreview in the Old Testament analogies. Now, last time we talked about the Babylonian captivity, where Israel, or rather Judah, had apostatized and had began to mix the holy with the profane, the holy worship of Almighty God, the Creator, with traditions and ceremonies and observing times and laws according to the the worship of Babylon, where they worship Baal and the Queen of Heaven. And because of that unlawful mixing of the, the holy with the profane, God literally led the the uh, the uh, Babylonish worshippers in Israel to Babylonish captivity, made them slaves in Babylon. God, in a sense, said, "If you want to worship like the Baal worshippers of Babylon, if you want to mix my holy name with that of Baal, then you go to Babylon to do it." And. Uh, These analogies in the scripture have relevance to us of the Protestant Reformation. And we need to heed the warnings of scripture and heed the warnings of history and make sure that we do not commit the same sins as Judah. Now, beginning on page 319, the the last full paragraph on the page, about the middle of the page, if you're following along on the online version, It says, the restoration from Babylon inaugurated a blessed era of civil and religious liberty. The restored remnant were not without severe trials, 
it was by no means easy for them to accomplish their task in face of the persistent and successful opposition of Sanballat the Horonite and his confederates and companies. Again and again, the work had to cease, and the people would have given up in despair, but for the encouraging and stimulating words of the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and other prophets. The joint ministry of Ezra and Nehemiah seems to have lasted about half a century, and they were permitted to see the work accomplished. The Jewish people liberated from their long exile, and better still, from all tendency to heathenism and idolatry. So it seems to indicate that they'd learned their lesson after serving in Babylon, correct? They came back to the land and they put away all their idolatrous uh, uh, practices. And he says further, he says, they never fell back into that sin after the return from Babylon. The long suspended worship of God was restored. Magistrates, judges, and teachers of the law were appointed over the land. The people entered into a solemn covenant to separate themselves from all idolaters and even, as painful as it was, from the heathen wives some of them had taken. And before Ezra and Nehemiah passed to their rest, the people, the worship, the temple, and the city were all restored, and the canon of Old Testament Scripture was arranged and closed. Many political and military troubles arose afterwards, but no such overthrow and restoration. It was to that second temple that Christ came, thus making the glory of the latter house greater than that of the former. Need I interpret all these true and yet typical history? Does it not apply itself to the latter antitypical history? Now, what's Henry Grattan Guinness saying? Do you, need I interpret for you what had happened to Judah and that it directly applies to us after the Babylonian captivity in, uh, of Rome and the liberation, the restoration of the temple at the Protestant Reformation? That's exactly what Henry Grattan Guinness is suggesting. He says, have you not seen the Reformation of the 16th century as I have described, the return from Babylon? Is not Jerusalem the true church and Babylon the false? And is not Babylon Rome? Scripture distinctly states this. Quote, the woman which thou sawest, that is, the one who was branded with the name Babylon, is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth, unquote. The angel said this to John. In John's day, no other great city than Rome ruled over the kings of the earth. Babylon represents Rome in Scripture. The captive Jews represent God's people oppressed in and by Rome. Their deliverance and restoration under Ezra and Nehemiah represent the Reformation under Martin Luther and John Calvin and other Protestant reformers. Their repentance and abandonment of idolatry, their reading of the Word of God, and reestablishment of the worship of God, all this had its peril in the movement we have described. Excuse me, all of this had its parallel in the movement we have described. Their building of Jerusalem and reorganization of Jewish polity and national life foreshadowed the constitution of reformed Protestant communities and nations. The duration of the two movements was the same, about half a century. The results of the two movements were similar in spite of much bitter but futile opposition. The proportion of the restored remnant was the same. Representatives of only two tribes out of the 12 returned to Jerusalem. Protestantism is growing now with amazing rapidity. 
But at the end of the 16th century, it was small compared with the hosts of Romanism. Both movements consisted of a spiritual work, an ecclesiastical work, and a political work. Both are connected <clears throat> with a recovered Bible, and both, quote-unquote, gave the sense of the original documents to the common people or made them understand the Word of God. Luther, Tyndale, and others translated the Bible into the vulgar tongues of, of Europe. The close and wonderful parallel extends to many particulars, which I have no time to indicate. Both movements occur late in the stories to which they respectively belong. And if the first advent belongs to the days of the restored temple, we have every reason to believe that the second will take place at this Protestant era. Or as I will show you presently, a, chrono a chronological prediction occurs in the prophecy of it in Revelation. But I must revert to the point of Israel's idolatry for a moment and ask you to glance at the remarkable development of this same sin in the apostasy in the Roman Catholic Church. All through its history, idolatry has been the most marked characteristic of the papal system. Romanism is simply the old Roman paganism revived under Christian names. Romanism and paganism bear to each other the most exact and extraordinary resemblance. Had paganism its temples and altars, its pictures and images? So has popery. Had paganism its use of holy water and its burning of incense? So has popery. Had paganism its tonsured priests presided over by a pontifex maximus or sovereign pontiff? So has popery. And it stamps this very name, which is purely heathen in origin, upon the coins, the medals, and the documents of the arrogant priest by whom it is governed. Had paganism its claim of sacerdotal infallibility? So has popery. Had paganism its adoration of a visible representative of deity carried in state on men's shoulders? So has popery. Had paganism its ceremony of kissing the feet of the sovereign pontiff? So has popery. Had paganism its college of pontiffs? So has popery in the college of cardinals. Had paganism its religious orders? So has popery. Had paganism its stately robes, its crowns, and its croziers of office? So has popery. Had paganism its, its adoration of idols, its worship of the queen of heaven, its votive offerings? So has popery. Had paganism its rural shrines of procession? So has popery. Had paganism its pretended miracles, its speaking images and weeping images and bleeding images? So has popery. Had paganism its begging orders and fictitious saints? So has popery. Had paganism its canonization of saints, as in the deification of the dead Caesars? So has popery. Had paganism its idolatrous calendar and numerous festivals? So has popery. Had paganism its enforced celibacy, its mystic signs, its worship of relics? So has popery. Had paganism its cruel persecution of those who opposed idolatry? So has popery. Was paganism satanically inspired? So is popery. God overthrew paganism. Satan revived it under Christian names. But God shall yet destroy it 
and sweep its hateful presence from the earth. And further, just as there never failed in Israel a line of faithful witnesses to testify against the idolatry of the people of God, so also in the case of Romanism. All the prophets prophets testified against Jewish idolatry. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, and Amos were burning witnesses against it. But perhaps the most typical witness of all was Elijah the Tishbite. This holy and earnest man was one who feared God and consequently feared not the face of his fellow man. Though Jezebel had slain the prophets of the Lord, he hesitates not to startle Ahab with the bold accusation that his idolatries were the cause of the famine that was desolating the land. Quote, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam, unquote. Forced to flee to the wilderness when Jezebel seeks his life, hear him plead with God that he had been jealous for his name, quote, because the children of Israel had forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away, unquote. Like these Jewish witnesses, the Christian witnesses of latter days were very jealous for the Lord, grieved and indignant at the desecration of his name and his cause. You know something, listeners? Sometimes people describe me as as indignant, angry, hostile. Listen again to the words. Of, of Henry Grattan Guinness. He says, like these Jewish witnesses, speaking of the prophets of God, the Christian witnesses, speaking of the Protestant reformers of latter days, were very jealous for the Lord, grieved and indignant at the desecration of his name and his cause. Like the prophets, they were opposed, despised, denounced, persecuted, exiled, and slain. Who were these Christian witnesses? They were, to use the words of one of them, an exiled Huguenot, quote, listen carefully. Those who since the birth of anti-Christianity have cried against its errors and idolatries, unquote. Who are they? but the Protestant reformers, those who were indignant against Antichrist and indignant against the Christian claim of idolatry, mixing the holy with the profane. They were God's men. They didn't, they didn't speak smooth things. They, they challenged the error of the day. And they were forceful and decisive in their speech. And yet they were reviled for standing firm for Christ. They were criticized as being, quote, unquote, hateful. They were criticized for being, quote, unquote, angry. They were persecuted. They were treated with wicked hands and wicked tongues. But they were those who, since the birth of anti-Christianity, since the birth of the Roman Catholic Church, have cried against its errors and idolatries, unquote. And if you wish to know their names, this Huguenot will tell you He says in his commentary on the Apocalypse, quote, they were called Berengarians, Stersorosists, Waldenses, 
Albigensians, Leonists, Petrobrusians, Henricians, Wycliffites, Lollards, etc., as they are now styled Lutherans, Zwinglians, Calvinists, Sacramentarians, Huguenots, heretics, and schismatics, etc. And to these reproachful names, their enemies added fines, confiscations, imprisonments, banishments, and condemnations to death, unquote. See what happens when you stand up for the truth? You are reviled even by God's own people. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's entitled Acts and Monuments of the Martyrs. If you desire a fuller account of the lives and testimonies of these faithful witnesses against Antichrist and his abominable idolatries, and of the sufferings they endured in the cause of truth throughout weary centuries, God never left himself without a witness. All through the dark ages, there were bold and holy men who stood aloof from Rome's corruptions, as we have seen, who denounced her idolatries, who endured her malice, who dared the fury of the wild beast, who resisted unto blood, striving against sin. We shall have to speak again of these, te- of these witnesses in connection with the New Testament prophecy of the Reformation. Meanwhile, let me remind you that from the existence of this analogy, it follows that the moral judgments which are applicable to the Jewish apostasy and Reformation are equally so to the Christian. To justify the Christian apostasy is in principle to justify that Jewish apostasy so singly condemned by the Word of God, and to condemn the Christian Reformation is in principle to condemn that Jewish Reformation so uh, evidently sealed with divine approval. To approve the apostasy, whether Jewish or Christian, is to approve the work of sin and Satan, and to condemn the Reformation whether Jewish or Christian, is to condemn the work of divine providence and grace. The enemies of the Protestant Reformation are the enemies of God. Let me read that again. The enemies of the Protestant Reformation are the enemies of Almighty God. Those who pulled down the sanctuary which the Reformation reared would have pulled down the second temple built by the exiles restored from Babylonish bondage. But what said the promise of God as to that second temple? Quote, Be strong, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you. I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace. Unquote. And again, quote, The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Unquote. Praise be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is the New Testament prophecy of the Protestant Reformation? We've seen it in the Old Testament. Surely no one can deny that the experiences of Israel, the experiences of Judah, apply to the experience of her scriptural antitype, scriptural archetype, the Protestant Reformers. So what does the New Testament prophesy about the Protestant Reformation? Do you realize that God for, put a foreview even in the New Testament about the Protestant Reformation? It was indeed the work of Almighty God, and it was a rejection of Rome. It was a rejection of idolatry. It was not ecumenical. It was exclusively Christ, uh, Christian, exclusively Christ. And it came about that because of a restored reading of the Word of God, 
by the people of God. One moment, please. Now, what about the New Testament prophecy of the Protestant Reformation? We turn now in the second place, says Henry Grattan Guinness, to the prophecies of the Protestant Reformation in the last book of the Bible. Here again, the prediction is an acted one. But instead of being acted in real history, it is acted as on a stage. The whole drama of the apocalypse is thus acted. Symbolic beings perform symbolic actions. The dramatist persona seen in the vision by John, by the Saint John include heavenly, earthly, and satanic beings, all of whom are represented symbolically. Christ is represented by quote a lamb as it had been slain unquote or by a mighty cloud clothed angel. Satan as an inspire as inspiring the Roman Empire by quote a great red dragon unquote and so on. In no other way could so vivid a foreview of the events of ages have been presented in so small a compass. The book of Revelation consists of John descriptions of a living, moving, acting hieroglyphs he saw. He uses constantly the words quote and I saw, unquote, and, quote, and I heard, unquote. In reading it, we should try first to realize accurately what the hieroglyph which John saw and described was, and then consider what it signified. Other scriptures' use of similar figures will in most cases give the clue to the meaning. John also takes part in this drama himself. He speaks and is spoken to, and when he does so, he represents the true witnesses of Christ at the time and in the circumstances prefigured. He is himself a hieroglyph, as it were, and stands as the representative of the true servants of God who would be living in the successive periods that uh, the events of which are predicted. The drama is a whole as a whole, foreshadows the external and interior and internal history of the church from John's own day to the second advent of Christ. As its outward history depends largely on the state of the world in which the church exists, much mere political history, many purely secular events, such as the overthrow of the Roman Empire, have their place in this prophetic drama. For just as if a traveler takes a voyage in a ship, the history of the ship becomes for the time his history, just as the story of an individual cannot be told without taking into account his environment. So the story of the church cannot be told without a consideration of the contemporaneous state of the world in which it exists. Moreover, providence employs outward events in the government of the church itself. Wars and invasions are judgments so are revolutions and insurrections, famines and pestilences. They have therefore properly their place in church history. But the church has also an inward spiritual history, which depends not on earthly events, but on heavenly and satanic action. If she is sustained, revived, increased, and rendered spiritually victorious, it is because her glorious head, Christ Jesus, is acting in her and on her behalf. If she is betrayed, corrupted, misled, or persecuted and oppressed, it is because Satan is acting against her in and by her enemies. In the apocalypse, these spiritual agencies are symbolized as well as material historical events. They are seen acting, but always indirectly throughout, uh, th uh, through outward agents. Thus, earthly material events are continually linked in this wonderful prophecy with their hidden spiritual causes. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, angels and archangels, and the spirits of the just 
are all seen in action under various symbols, and so also are the devil and his agents. Under the symbols of the dragon and the wild beast, they are seen opposing and counterworking Christ and persecuting and slaughtering his faithful witnesses. The visions of his holy and sanctifying book, to the study of which a special blessing is attached, constitute a prophetic history of the church and the world from apostolic days, from apostolic days to the present day and on to the end of this age. In other words, the book of Revelation encompasses the entire history of the church from apostolic times until the time of Christ's return. No futurism in that, is there? He says they are, as you know, arranged in order in three groups of seven. First, seven seals, then seven trumpets, and then seven vials. Speaking broadly, for I have no time to do more, nor is it needful to our subject, the first six seals represent events extending from John's own day until the fall of paganism and the establishment of Christianity in the Roman earth. While the seventh contains the seven trumpets and all that follows, the first four trumpets depict the Gothic invasions and the overthrow of the old Roman Empire in the 5th century. The next two trumpets give events in the east instead of the west, the fifth uh, predicting the Saracenic conquests of the 7th and 8th centuries, symbolized as the ravages of an army of locusts. Quite different than the interpretation we're given today, isn't it? I, I want to remind the listeners, since the book of Revelation is so hard to understand by Christians of this era, then we ought to find out how it was interpreted in the Protestant era. Remembering that we're in the post-Protestant age, after Vatican Council II, after futurism has done all of its damage and has exonerated the papacy, we're the only generation of Christians who are deceived about or, or uh, un, uh, difficult to understand the book of Revelation. Here is Henry Grattan Dennis telling us what these vials and seals and trumpets represented to the Protestant reformers. This is how they interpreted the, the, the scriptures. And their interpretation of the prophecies are, are representative of actual historical events that took place throughout the entire Christian era. So again, if you want, if you, if you want to read this more, I, I remind the listeners to turn to page 331 in this online version of, of, of Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness, page 331, and you'll find this copy on uh, the University of Toronto, okay, on their website. Just, just Google the title, Romanism and the Reformation, and it's like the second selection down. You'll see the University of Toronto, and you can, you can uh, click on that, and it'll take you to this book. You can uh, make it full screen and then forward to page 331 to read the Protestant interpretation of the prophecies in the book of Revelation that are, that are completely twisted out of recognition by the preachers of today. All right? Now, let me back up just a little bit for continuity. It says the first four trumpets depict the Gothic invasions and the overthrow of the Roman, of the old Roman Empire of the 5th century. In other words, the empire of the Caesars before the Roman Catholic Church was established, right? It says the next two trumpets give rise to the east instead of the west, uh, rather give events in the east instead of the west. The fifth predicting the Saracenic conquest of the 7th and 8th centuries. Remember the Saracens? Okay, this is historical fulfillment of these prophecies. It says, predicting the Saracenic conquest of the 7th and 8th centuries, 
symbolized as the ravages of an army of locusts. And the sixth, the Turkish invasions of Eastern Europe, which extended from the middle of the 11th century to the middle of the 15th. These and the intolerable misery they occasioned to the Greek churches in the East are symbolized under the sixth trumpet by the career of the Euphratian horsemen in the ninth chapter of the book. This vision brings down the prophetic history to the fall of Constantinople, the capital of the Eastern Empire of Rome, before the Turks in A.D. 1453. And the remainder of the 15th century seems covered in the prophecy by the statement that, quote, the rest of the men who were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, unquote. Do you know what the worship of devils is? The worship of idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood. This description of continued obdurate and inveterate apostasy and idolatry applies to both the Eastern and the Western Christendom at that time. Thus, we're brought down chronologically to the end of the 15th century, and then there is a break and a great change in the series of visions. And what is the next scene that attracts the eye of the Holy Seer, John the, the Revelator? It is a vision symbolic of the Reformation movement of the 16th century, coupled with a retrospective narrative of the history of Christ's true witnesses against idolatry from the beginning of the apostasy to the close of the Protestant Reformation. You'll find this most interesting prophecy in the 10th and first 13 verses of the 11th chapter of Revelation. Study it carefully at your leisure, and you will see that the vision consists of the manifestation of a glorious, mighty angel who evidently symbolizes Christ himself and of the bestowal by him on John, the revelator, in his representative character of three things. Number one, of a little book which he has to eat. Number two, of a great commission which he was to execute. And number three, of a reed with which he was to measure the temple of God. There follows the story of Christ's two witnesses, symbolized by two olive trees and two candlesticks, the narrative of their doings and sufferings, of their persecution and slaughter by their enemies, of their brief trance-like death, and of their speedy resurrection and exaltation. Lastly, there is a great earthquake, or revolution, and the fall of a tenth part of the city, or a tenth part of Roman Christendom. Do you ask my grounds for asserting that the mighty angel of this vision is no other than Christ himself? I will give you them, his power and glory, the rainbow encircling his head, the sun-like brightness of his countenance, and the resemblance of his feet, two pillars of fire, all these features identify him with the Son of Man, seen by John in the first vision of this book. His position and his words identify him also with the one whom Daniel, in his last chapter, calls my Lord. No mere angel is cloud-clothed and rainbow-crowned, resplendent as the sun, or speaks with a voice full of majesty, or assumes an, alt an attitude which implies the lordship of earth and sea, setting his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth. No angel would talk of my two witnesses or claim to give to men power and authority. There is a loftiness of tone and a sublimity of appearance and action about this angel that distinguishes him from all the other lowly servant angels of the book as widely as heaven is, dis is distinguished from earth. It is the Lord of angels and of men alike who is manifested in action at this point in the apocalyptic drama. And the very manifestation prepares us for events of the first magnitude, 
events like those which succeeded Christ's actual manifestation on earth, events like the first promulgation of the gospel in the apostolic age. The manifestation is, of course, only symbolic. The prediction is not that Christ would visibly appear at the juncture in question. He would act, but indirectly. His action would be the cause of human action. His glorious influence and interference would become visible in the course of mundane events. He would reveal his power in his providence. This glorious being holds in his hand not seven stars as in the first vision, but a little book open. At a command from heaven, John asks the angel for this little book and receives it with the injunction, take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. It is immediately added, thou must prophesy or preach again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings, unquote. Now, this same remarkable figure of eating a book and then going forth to proclaim to others its contents does not occur here for the first time. We need it in the Old Testament, where Ezekiel is commanded to eat a roll and go and speak to the house of Israel, and the action is thus explained. Ezekiel says, quote, I did eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said to me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. All my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart, and hear with thine ears. And go, get thee unto the children of thy people, and speak unto them, and tell them, Thus saith the Lord God, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear, unquote. We have no question, therefore, as to the meaning of this emblematic action in the vision. John was first to appropriate and digest the contents of the little book, and then to go forth and proclaim its message to the others as the word of the Lord. Now, what is this little book? What can it be but the Bible, that blessed gift of God, his own word? It is here seen afresh a second time to the church, and indeed, so long had the Bible been buried in Latin, so long withheld from the people, so long made void by the traditions of men, that it was a new book given afresh to the church when it was, as it were, rediscovered, restudied, and republished by the Protestant reformers at the close of the Dark Ages. When Martin Luther, then a student in the University of Erfurt and about the 20 years of his age, first accidentally found a Latin Bible, he was amazed. Quote, One day he opened several books of the library, one after the other, to see who their authors were. One of the volumes which he opens in its turn attracts his attention. He has never before seen one like it. He reads the title. It is the Bible, a rare book at that time, unknown. His interest is strongly excited. He is perfectly astonished to find in this volume anything more than those fragments of Gospels and Epistles which the Roman Catholic Church has selected to be read publicly in the churches every Sabbath day. Heretofore, he had believed that those, those, uh, excuse me, he had believed that these formed the whole Word of God. Okay? I want to reiterate these bits and fragments of the Bible that were approved by the Roman Catholic hierarchy to be read in the churches represented but a fraction of the whole Word of God. And here Martin Luther, in this dusty library, actually finds a complete Bible. And now his eyes are open. His church does not preach the whole gospel. I hope you're following along here. He says, hitherto, in other words, before this, he had believed that these formed the whole word of God, these bits and pieces that were approved by the church. And he says, but here are so many pages, chapters, and books of which he had no idea. 
Now, this was Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer who was a Roman Catholic monk. He had no idea how big the Bible was until he had first seen a copy of it. It says his heart beats as he holds in his hand all this divinely inspired scripture. And he turns over all the leaves with feelings which cannot be described. The first page on which he fixes his attention tells him the history of Hannah and young Samuel. He reads, and his soul is filled with joy to overflowing. The child whom his parents lent to Jehovah for all the days of his life. The song of Hannah in which she declares that the Lord lift up the poor from the dust and the needy from the dunghill, that he may set him with princes. Young Samuel, growing up in the presence of the Lord, the whole of this history, the whole of the volume which he has discovered, make him feel in a way he has never done before. He returns home, his heart full. Oh, thinks he, would it please God one day to give me such a book for my own? Would it please God that one day Martin Luther might be given the word of God for his own? He'd never seen it in the Roman Catholic Church. And God did give him his own copy of the Bible. And Martin Luther righteously and defiantly against his church, taking his life into his own hands, translated that Bible into the German language so that the people, Roman Catholics all, could read it for themselves. Praise Almighty God. It says, Luther as yet did not know either Greek or Hebrew, for it is not probable that he studied these languages during the first two or three years of his residency at the university. The Bible, which he had so overjoyed, which so overjoyed him, was in Latin. Soon returning to his treasure in the library, he reads and rereads, and in his astonishment and joy returns to read again. The first rays of a new truth were then dawning upon him. In this way, God put him in possession of his word. He, was, he has discovered the book which he has one day to give his countrymen in that admirable translation in which Germany has now for three centuries perused the oracles of God. It was perhaps the first time that any hand had taken down this precious volume from the place which it had occupied in the library of Erfurt. This book, lying on the unknown shelves of an obscure chamber, is to become the book of life to a whole people. And I will add the words to a whole world. The Protestant Reformation was hid in that Bible, unquote. Later on, when soul agony had driven the young student from his loved, beloved university into a Benedictine convent to seek the salvation for which he longed, it was the same blessed book with its glorious doctrines of the forgiveness of sins and justification by faith alone that calmed his storm-tossed spirit and quickened his soul to new spiritual life. Stoppitz, the vicar general of his order, who proved himself a true pastor to the poor young monk, gave him a Bible of his own. His joy was great. He soon knew where to find any passage he needed. With intense earnestness, he studied its pages, and especially the epistle of St. Paul. Right valiantly did the young reformer use the word of the Spirit thus placed in his hand. Quote, The Reformation, which commenced with the struggles of a humble soul in the cell of a convent in Erfurt, has never ceased to advance. An obscure individual with the word of life in his hand had stood erect in presence of worldly grandeur 
and made it tremble. This word he had opposed first to Tetzel and his numerous hosts, and these avaricious merchants, after a monetary resistance, excuse me, after a momentary resistance, had taken flight. In other words, if you remember the history, it was during Martin Luther's time that the Antichrist of the Bible, the papacy, was building what is known today as St. Peter's Basilica, the biggest Roman Catholic church in the world. And in order to raise money for that incalculably expensive project, and if you've never seen pictures of the inside of the Vatican, I, you know, they're available on the Internet. You've never seen such splendor in your life. In order to raise money for this incalculably expensive endeavor, the Roman Catholic Church used what is, it, what is called simony in the Bible. The buying and selling of ecclesiastical office and also the selling of forgiveness of sin for money became a directive among the priests of Rome. They were all to go about selling indulgences. Okay, that's another word for simony. Selling indulgences is like buying stock today. And Tetzel would ring his bell and say, you know, for every coin in the coffer clings, a soul from purgatory springs. In other words, if you want to you want to uh, uh, buy the spirits of your dead family out of the flames of purgatory, all you had to do was pay the Roman Catholic Church. And the Pope, by his heavenly power, would turn his key, his golden key, and unlock purgatory and, 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 and rescue your family and bring them to heaven. It sounds ludicrous, but that's truth. That's exactly what was happening. And, of course... Martin Luther, who'd been liberated by the Word of God, knew then what simony was. He knew what indulgences were. It was a lie. And so Tetzel was, atta- <clears throat> was attacked by Martin Luther and other reformers by the Word of God and those who spoke it and those who read it. They condemned the Roman Catholic Church as the synagogue of Satan, as the house of simony, And that's how the Protestant Reformation began. Martin Luther rebelled, protested against the sins and the idolatry and the lying lying doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church, particularly, and not only, but particularly, the selling of indulgences, the buying and selling of the forgiveness of sin for money in order to finance the biggest most expensive, the most glorious and gold-clad chicken house in the world, the Vatican, St. Peter's Basilica, okay? It says, an obscure individual with the word of life in his hand had stood erect in in the presence of worldly grandeur and made it tremble. Who's he talking about, this worldly grandeur? The Pope, okay? And the kings of the earth over which he ruled, he made them all tremble. Why? Because he had the word of God in his hand, and he understood it. And by understanding the word of God, he understood what the Roman Catholic Church then represented, the Antichrist, the synagogue of Satan, and he made it tremble because he had the word of God in his hand. He said this word he had opposed he, he opposed first to Tetzel and his numerous host, and these avaricious merchants, the sellers of indulgences, after a momentary resistance, had taken flight. That's right. The word of God and spoken by, by Martin Luther and other reformers condemning Tetzel and the other sellers of these indulgences put them to flight. And that's what happens when we resist Satan by the word of God. He must flee. Stand by for one second. I've got some laryngitis here. I need a drink. I'll be back. 
Okay, my apologies. <clears throat> my apologies. I'll continue now. It says, next, he had opposed it to the legate of Rome at Oxburg. And the legate, paralyzed, had allowed his prey to escape. See what power the word of God has? And it says, at a latter period, he had opposed it uh, to the cham- uh, to the champions of learning in the halls of Leipzig. And the astonished theologians had seen the syllogistic weapons broken to pieces in their hands. That's what the Word of God does to Roman Catholicism. Turns their weapons to dust. The Word of God, it has power to defeat Antichrist and the synagogue of Satan. That's what the Protestant believers the Protestant reformers believed, and that's what they practiced. Open spiritual warfare against the Roman Catholic Church. And the, and, the, and the weapons of the Roman Catholic Church just simply were reduced to dust right in their hands. Okay? All you have to do is speak the truth. You don't have to kill anybody. God said, thou shalt not kill. All you have to do is go forth with the word of God in your mouth and defeat Satan, just like Jesus did in the, in, in the hour of his temptation. He says, at last, he had opposed it to the Pope, who, disturbed in his sleep, had risen up upon his throne and thundered at the troublesome monk. There's your papal thunder. He says, but the whole power head of Christendom this word had paralyzed. You want to paralyze the Antichrist? To wait for Christ to come? The only reason the Antichrist can't be defeated in this life is because God's people use the right weapons. And once they have those weapons, they are fearful to use them. But I don't intend to fight this war sitting on a bench preserving my life is a fight for Christ and against Antichrist. I've got no reason to. Sitting on a bench is not an option for Inquisition Update for Tom Press. I'm not going to take this fight sitting down. I'm not going to proclaim defeat when I've got the most powerful weapon in the universe in my hand, the word of Almighty God, and I'm going to follow the examples of the Protestant no matter what it costs me, my life isn't worth a nickel being to see in this Antichrist system. I'm going to live forever. We all have to realize that we're made of flesh. We're immortal. We must die. And I've made one resolution to my myself, I'm not going to die. I'm going to gut the enemy. Because after I die, just like a kernel of corn that is cast into the ground and sown, it must first die. Then it springs life, a new life. And that's the life that I covet. This one, this fleshly life, has been ruined by the slavery of the papacy by the slavery of this new world order system, which is simply the the old one that Martin Luther fought. And I'm not going to sit while Satan makes slaves of God's people. The word had still a last struggle to maintain. It behooved to triumph over the emperor of the West, over the kings and the princes of the earth, and then victorious over all the powers of the world, take its place in the church to reign in its pure word of God. We have come up against power, and I'm losing my voice as we speak. My apologies if I've seen. No, I'm not going to apologize. 
We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.